We are here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, so let us do that with zeal and gladness. This is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr. Thanking you as always for being here with us on this lovely day the Lord has made. And as always, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I just pray that you are keeping the Lord Jesus Christ out front as we move through this year, uh, as you're going through your daily living, as you're, as you're moving through out whatever you're doing, keep Christ out front. We cannot say it enough because it's so important, especially in this world where we got protests on all the campuses and we've got things going on around the world. You need to keep the Lord Jesus Christ out front of you and whatever you're doing from the lowliest of things to the highest of things, God wants to lead the way in all of them. All right, so let's get started. Our morning scripture comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, which reads, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And that we just talked about that. That is the perfect verse for the perfect day the Lord has made. We've got to keep these activities going on consistently, daily, every portion of your life that way you know you're covered and you know that you know that you know that the lord jesus christ is leading you and your family into the next portion of your life and we want to pray for all of those though that may not have that portion they may not have that comfort that covering of the lord jesus christ and they might be lost in the protest and the and all the things that are going on around the world they might be lost in that thinking that is going to be their savior when we know the truth and we know that is not the case so we want to pray for them we want to pray for their eyes to be revealed and for the lord to present himself to them in a manner that he can only choose at a time that he can only choose. So let's pray. Gracious and almighty God, we lift our hearts to you in a time of turmoil and seeking. For all those who stand in protest and participate in uprisings, we ask for your protection and guidance over them. We know that they have been led astray, some of them willingly, some of them just wanted to be a part of something bigger than themselves, and they missed the cross by the long shot. We ask you to grant them the courage to advocate for the truth of you and justice with peace in their hearts from Christ Jesus. We ask you to enlighten those in positions of power to listen with open ears and to act justly, ensuring the dignity and rights of all of the people that are being involved or upheld. Not just one that is being uh, catered to. We want everybody. May the Holy Spirit of peace that brings peace prevail in every conversation and confrontation. We pray that your love be the foundation on which new paths of understanding and equity are built. We pray, Father, that somewhere in everything that has gone on the past two weeks, you will be revealed. Something from you will be revealed that put people on a new path away from the advocacy of darkness to the truth of your light. Lord, we know that we did not send these young men and women to college to do such things. I'm sure there's a parent out there right now wondering, what is my baby doing? I didn't send them up here for that. I didn't send her out there for that. But we also know, Lord, that if we train up a child in the way they should go, they would not depart either. So we pray that as we're in our, in our high school years with these young men and women, that we will train them in the way of your word so that when they get out in these places of college and higher levels of education and training for the world, that they will not become of the world, that they will stay with you and the training will activate at the right time and they will remember you, Lord, in these times of confusion and in these times where Satan and his demons are recruiting at a very high level. We trust you, Lord. We trust your word and we trust to do everything we can to build up your people but that's because of you, not because of us. 
Help us remember that. To keep you first always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so our topic today is I don't think you know who my God is. How many times have you said that? How many times have you looked at people and situations and they're bumping the gums and you're looking at them like, I really don't think you know who my God is. You know, I had that situation that happened to me a couple of years ago when I bought my new home here in Pennsylvania and I had uh all the realtors and the financial people were letting me know how, and you know, it may happen, it may not happen. You know, this this my old house in Virginia Beach may not sell, and all these things. They meant no harm. They're doing their job, but at the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I don't think you know who my God is. <laughs> I don't think you do because that house in Virginia Beach sold within 24 hours. It was a done deal. We had two cash offers. I mean, why? Because I knew who to go to. I knew who to trust, who to turn to. And I trusted my team. They did a fantastic job in selling the house and buying my new one. But in the back of my mind, I knew God was leading the way in all of it. And, and I hope that whatever you're going through, that you think in the same context. Yes, you, you've got good people around you. Yes, they're going to tell you all the facts and figures. But then there is God, people. There is God. And that's where we're going today when we say, I don't think you know who my God is. You know, when you hear people talking about the impossibilities of life, that's the only response you got is, I, I don't think you know who my God is. And and we're coming from uh, 2 Kings 19, 9 through 19. Go ahead and turn to that there. 2 Kings 19, 9 through 19, which reads as follows. Now, Sereknareb received a report from that Tikara, the king of Cush, was marching out against him. So he again sent messengers to Hezekiah with this word. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessors deliver them, the gods of Gozan, Aaron, Rezveh, and the people of Eden who were in Telazar? Where is the king of Hamath or the king of Arpad? Where is the king of Lair, Seraphim, and Hena, and Iva? Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the people of the, went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Snechtherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone, fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you now to bless the reading of your already blessed words. Say what needs to be said. Do what needs to be done as we go about understanding your word. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. We should always be prepared for some for someone or people to consider our faith in God of the Bible worthless. We should be ready for them to try anything and everything to make you stumble, to trick you into a weird compromise. This will even go as far as taking God's word and twisting the scriptures to a point that they'll have you listening to them and trusting them and trusting a form of godliness how can christians fall prey to such things because because yes because christians can fall prey to such things two ways first to make you doubt the source in which you are receiving biblical instruction your church your pastor life groups all the methodologies we use to teach and share the redemptive work of jesus christ so if you turn on that stop coming to church stop 
Start posting on social media a different view of how you see God because you want to be kind and you you want to do good and hate speech hate speech this and that about the Bible. The unclean spirits around you will now embrace you as one of them, and all the doors swing open in this world. And before you know it, the person that used to sit in these pews are now on the other side doing what? Wanting to burn these pews in this church to the ground. This is nothing new. In Romans 1, 21 through 25, Paul says this, For all they, they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Verse 24, therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. There it is right there and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. And we sit here watching, knowing it could be different. We watch loved ones suffer, strangers suffer, church people suffer. And we say to ourselves on the other side watching, I don't think you know who my God is. In 2 Kings 19, we see a situation in Judah where King Sennacherib has set his eyes on taking the people of God down. In chapter 18, we read how, the, how Israel fell and he had taken many fortified cities in Judah. He had sent his supreme commander to intimidate the people and the king's representation. He spoke in Hebrew intentionally, though the reps wanted him to speak in Aramaic, but he did this to encourage them not to trust King Hezekiah nor the, nor the God that he served because everyone else had done the same and had fallen to the Assyrians. So now in verse nine, in chapter 19, we see how God has sent distractions to the Assyrian commander, and we know it's God because of verses 7 and 8, which read, Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with a sword. When the field commander heard that the king of Assyria had left Lachish, he withdrew and found the king fighting against Libna. So we know God made that occur. What is it that God made occur? The distraction. To get their minds off of his people. But alas, it didn't last long. Then in verse 9, King Sreknarab gets a word that the king of Cush is coming after him. So God is keeping this man so tied up that he's going to work overtime to take down God's people because one more time, he's got somebody else coming after him. And it's funny because God will do that today, won't he? God will keep your enemy so distracted so that they won't have time to come after you because they've got to deal with everybody else is coming after them. But how do we know when we're dealing with someone that doesn't know the God that we serve? He has no idea who our God is. How do we know people like this king that have this ignorance, this spiritual ignorance? How do we know? They don't know who your God is because they use psychological warfare and the rhetoric of being invincible. They're going to try and work to get to the soul of the matter. Your trust in Jesus Christ. If they can get you to operate on your own and separate your thinking from your relationship with God, they can practically get you to do anything at that point. And maybe you've seen this happen where someone you knew who was of God fell victim to this warfare. And before you know it, they're they're gone to the other side, spiritually destroyed or a walking billboard for sin. Never forget Satan's objective, and that is to destroy what God has created. He doesn't win, and he knows this, but he's going to take as many people to hell with him that he can before he loses. Now, let's break down the PSYOP 
in these uh, few areas. First, he attacks their dependence on God's word. The beginning of verse 10 says this. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says. Did you catch that? He's basically telling them whatever word you receive from the Lord in this moment will lead you astray. Be not deceived, friends. For all the way back in the Garden of Eden, the serpent did the same thing to Adam and Eve, accusing the Lord of being deceptive. We see that in Genesis 3. And they exchanged the conditions and comforts for the Lord's fellowship for knowledge, and they fell. It was heartbreak in paradise. And we see that playing out here with an attack on the credibility of God's word. Move to verse 12, you see the second part of the PSYOP, and that is the misplaced alignment of our God. He puts our God beside everyone else's God and lets the king know your God is no different. How many times have you heard that? How many times have you heard that throughout this world that our God is no different? Amazing, is it not? But yet, we still try to reach them, don't we? We try to show them that our God is the God. The God of the Bible is the one true God. We show them through examples. We show them through the natural beauty and wonders of this earth. And here he is putting our God beside everybody else's God and letting the king know yours is no different. But oh, if I don't think he knows who our God is like the world today doesn't know who our God is. They weren't there when God got you up from the pain. They weren't there when you were struggling to pay bills and maintain a uh, marriage. They weren't there when the rent was due and you had run out of plans. And they surely weren't there when you were judged on who you married and coming to church every Sunday when everything seemed to be lost. No, they were not there for that. But God was and is and will always be there for that. And that should be a big amen from someone out there. Because someone out there recognizes that sometimes you will find yourself by yourself and the only person out there that is believing in you and encouraging you and cheering you on is the voice in the presence of God. And this is why it's so important to solidify the connection with God the Father, through God the Son, through being born again. This is why your relationship in Jesus Christ is so important, because there is no other way to fight off the battles of the mind and the heart than through accepting Christ as Lord of your life, your everything, and you holding firm to God's word that from that point forward. And here's the deal. Your enemy might be right. Maybe, just maybe, everything has fallen to your left and to your right. But make sure you let them know and smile when you do it. That I don't think you know who my God is. Second of all, I don't think they know who, who my God is because they don't know my relationship with him. And when they don't know your relationship with God, they won't understand your response. And for the king, it came in two forms. First, there was his immediate surrender of the situation and the submission of that situation to God. Verse 14, we read, Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. He then went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. So he maintained situational awareness of what, he was, what was going on, but surrendered any decision and submitted it to the Lord by going to the temple and presenting it there. There was no war council. There was no meeting after the meetings because as a man or woman of God, your first response comes from the Lord, not from you. And this is where some people's zeal gets the best of them. They want to jump out there and they want to respond. Did you carry it to the Lord first? They want to go out there and, and protest with everybody else against this evil. They, we should be heard. We got to show them we're not going to take this. Very true. I understand all that. Did you consult the Lord first? 
Well, you know, I, I didn't have to. I, I understand what you're saying, Reverend Allen, but at the same time, though, we've got to get out there. We've got to do something. Yes, I agree with that as well. Did you consult the Lord first? The one thing I've learned in this life that when I don't consult the Lord first, I make mistakes. And I don't want you to make those same mistakes. Look at the example King Hezekiah sets here. He goes to the Lord first. So if you receive the problems in your hands and you have it, you are to take it out of your hands and give it to God. Because if you're a child of God, if you're somebody who claims that they believe in Jesus Christ, I know that the Lord sent him to save me from my depraved nature to being nailed on an old rugged cross to be resurrected then this should be a muscle memory for you. You care to the Lord first. Because my prayer is going to be, well, Lord, you saw it like I saw it. That's how I'm going to say it. And I'm going to give this situation over to you and spread it out so that you can clearly see what's going on. Not only that, notice the second action, he prayed. When was the last time you prayed over your, your, your situation, your circumstance? What was the last time that you may have gotten annoyed when someone said, I'm gonna pray for you, or let's pray over this, when you were looking for something maybe a little more substantial, something tangible that you can put your hands on, and they simply offer, we're gonna pray for you. And you need to pray for yourself. Did you get offended? Did you get tight? Get angry? Yeah, probably so. What did he pray for? He first gives recognition of who he is praying to, which he acknowledges where God stands in the universe. And then he requests his attention to what he has not done to the king, but to God. In other words, let's, let's, let's clear that up a little bit. What Hezekiah does here is he recognizes who God is. He puts God back in his perspective place. And what he does next is let it be known. Look at what they've done to you. Because Hezekiah realized very quickly, this is not about me. This has always been about God. Don't get offended and don't act like you got to fight everything, if not any of it. You got to recognize like the king did here. This is never, nor has it ever been about you. This is about the God that you serve. When things go crazily wrong, this is about the God that you serve. And then we see where he goes about acknowledging what the Assyrians have done in verses 17 through 18 to other gods, but he still puts God back in his proper place and the dialogue by acknowledging these gods were not gods at all. They were beating false gods. They thought they were beating the God, but they knew that these people had all these other gods that were worshiping. And they said, we'll beat their God, and then we'll go beat their God, and then we'll beat their God. So now they think they're going to beat the God. But the problem is, though, he is the God to us, not to them. To the Assyrians, the God of the Bible was just another God. that They were going to take down and, and break the spirit of the people and take them in and make them their people. But they were already beating fake gods, gods that, did, gods that did not even exist. And Hezekiah is saying to God, we know you're not one of them. He's saying, I don't think they know who my God is. And then he breaks from the situation into a prayer request. He does two things. He prays for deliverance and in, in verse 19, but he also prays for revelation. He prays for deliverance to get his people out of that situation but also prays for the revelation of those people that are attacking them, as well as everybody else. If you're saying to yourself, I don't think they know who my God is, then should we not be praying for their eyes to be open to know who our God is? I, I would think that's biblical common sense. I, I want you to know who my God is. That way you can see why I'm standing the way I am standing against you. It will hopefully prompt you to at least consider that this must be the true God. To know why 
God sent his son to down the cross. Do you pray this happens? Because if you're not, how do you think missions work is done in countries where people are hostile to the Lord Jesus Christ, hostile to his people? I'm telling you, someone's out there praying. Someone's praying for the opportunity that the Lord gets the glory through his revelation, through something they're able to do, manifested by God, put in our hands to operate on behalf of the kingdom so that God gets the glory. And when you reach that level of your prayer, you stand by and God will do the rest. You might be in an area of the city or maybe in your neighborhood where a lot of folks aren't Christian, where you hear all sorts of things going on at night and they're trying to get you involved or they may, they may know you're a person of the Lord and they kind of want you out. And so they're doing things to you. They're saying things to you. You just step back. You let you, you carry that to the Lord and you let the Lord take care of that. Don't you get involved. Don't try to get hostile with them. You hold your ground firm. You fight the battles God tells you to fight. And then when God says not to fight at all, or maybe it comes to a time to where you might think all is lost, you find your secret place in your house, the place where you pray, where the silence is deafening, and you break open your word and you pray and you acknowledge the almighty, all living God. And you present to him everything that's being done to him because you're one of his people. And if they're doing it to you, they're not doing it to you. They're doing it to him. And you acknowledge the fact that, yes, they they think they're doing something big. They think they are getting to us. But they're coming after you, Lord. And here's the thing. The, the most important part of this whole story is at the end where he's praying for everybody to have a revelation from God, to be for God to be revealed to all these kingdoms that are being affected. Everybody that is here right now, I pray, Lord, that you reveal yourself to them. And let them see that you are the one true God. This is what Hezekiah is expressing in the end. He's very much aware his people are in trouble. He's very much aware that they're on the brink of being overtaken. Uh, they have taken taken down some of the the Jew the the, the the fortified cities in Judah. He's already seen Israel fall, and here he is. They're knocking at the door, and they're saying, "Don't you do it? I get it. You got a God too. Well." The rest of them had gods and you saw what happened to them. Are you going to trust in your God too? Don't be deceived. Don't let your God deceive you. He, he can't save you. And, and don't y'all sit there and let Hezekiah lead you down astray. They're doing the same thing right now in 2024. My question is, are you going to God presenting the situation? Be quiet. Now you're ready to watch him work because what he does when you do that will blow your mind. Now, what he does here in the scriptures, what happens next? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to join us next week as we complete part two of this series on uh, understanding what God's response is to the king. And maybe you can find a, uh, a little bit of faith there in that as well and in, in knowing that there is a response. And when God responds, man, does he ever respond? And maybe you're here and you might need somebody to pray with. So we want to pray with you as well. Of course, contact us via the information provided earlier in the show. And we'll be sure to get back with you and reach out to you and do what is necessary. And visit www.get-prayer.com for all your prayer needs. Until next time, may God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And God willing, we'll see you next week. You take care.